What you're about to see is what I think a really phenomenal conversation interview with James Jandrish, a phenomenal film score. And today we're going to talk about many things, but one of the most fascinating things I found is how he makes the music for the soundtracks for movies and TV shows for Netflix in about 10 days. Stay tuned and stick around for the interview. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much, James, for taking the time to come on the channel. I really appreciate you. So for those that are not super familiar with you and your work, can you give a little bit of a backstory, you know, a little 30 second to one minute story? of you and who you are in the music industry and what you do. Hey, how's it going? So my name's James and I'm essentially a film composer, which means that I write music for film exclusively, mostly doing soundtracks these days, mostly doing series work. I'm uh, fortunate to be very busy, which is awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. great, man. So funny story, funny connection in the sense of like, I so I make music for a living, but I now do songwriting uh, as mm -hmm. a musician myself. But my first love in the music industry, one of my first loves was film, comp like it was movie scoring. So I thought it was the coolest thing ever you know i wanted to be the next hans zimmer at the time you know in high yeah. school right as everyone <laughs> right and says that to sure. everybody yeah sure but i just i was so mm -hmm. fascinated with it i thought it was so so remarkable if you listen to a movie or a tv show or anything even a youtube video without the music how much of a different dynamic change it has and i thought that the, the it was so f uh, phenomenal how you could evoke such different emotion with the different music you put behind there so i thought it was such a, a, an interesting industry and i really i really enjoyed it because you had you essentially had control over 50 percent of the narrative i felt like yeah, you know, sound is uh, half the movie, right? And music is is huge. Usually in, in films, uh, the really good ones are the choices of when to play just music. But, you know, I'm a little biased in that respect. Mm. You know, essentially, score can a lot of the times make or break a film. And, you know, if you're lucky, you can you can help it along for sure. Absolutely. You know, massively important. Massively Absolutely. Important. I mean, just even right off the top of my head, the first one that pops into my head is that Titanic scene, you know, where they're standing at the, the front of the, the, the boat, <laughs> right? World, baby. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, but there's, yeah. I don't remember what the dialogue is. All I hear is Celine Dion singing My Heart Will Go On, right? <laughs> right? Like, and it's like, Absolutely. I don't even know if that's part of the movie there, because that's like the general main soundtrack of the, the theme, right? But like, yeah, I don't yeah. even know if that, that is there, but like that cinematic picture is just so iconic and it's just most of it's just music right you know it's just fascinating how much it can it, um influence the movie or TV absolutely show. absolutely it's um best i can describe it is the unwritten character that moves wow. you along you know hmm. the, the narrator you know someone once said you know as as a composer you're essentially performing the film to the audience telling them what to feel what to what to say, what to think, what to question, you know, enormous power, you know, so whatever you do, don't screw up, man. <laughs> yeah, no pressure, right? <laughs> That's amazing. So, so let's take this actually a little bit farther back. I'd love to hear your story on how you got involved in the film score industry. Well, it goes quite far back. Um, so it starts with my dad. My dad is a monster, monster jazz player, uh, jazz pianist. And uh, interestingly enough, he uh, started off on the accordion, of all hmm. things, you know, playing some, some polkas and stuff. And then he got a record player that you could essentially go down half speed and, and figure stuff out. So then he, he became <laughs> a jazz freak. And, uh, you know, his parents kind of wanted to go in law so he went to law school and at the to pay for it he he uh would play at you know the club morocco in town and uh, as, a, as a as a jazz gig and then you know second year he kind of realized that you know i'm doing okay gigging you know <laughs> and this might be a fun thing to do so he quickly kind of became the guy around town and up in canada here we have i guess the equivalent of UK's BBC is called the CBC and he became musical director of that so wow. he was a guy he, he was a guy in charge geez it would have been almost 25 30 years of all the music kind of stuff would go through him you know and you know I was a kid I was just falling around going you know dad you're really cool I want to be like you <laughs> and I'm sitting in these sessions and these sessions are amazing you know um and it was really really great to follow him around so so essentially I I you know, I idled him, I modeled, you know, essentially life after him. The interesting thing was I also had a kind of a parallel interest with sports, mm. uh, with in particular um, football. It got to the point where, you know, uh, there's a good chance where I could kind of turn pro and I did for a bit. And then I got a pretty nasty head injury and I couldn't move essentially for about a year. Wow. Uh, it was really, really yucky. And at that point, um, you know, music 
really, really, really helped me out. And mm -hmm. it was always there. I played um, in school growing up. I played, uh, started off with viola. We had a strings, strings course, and then that turned to guitar, and that turned to bass, and that turned to keyboards, and that kept on going. So on the other sideline, I also played in a bunch of bands too, you know, as a kind of a multi-instrumentalist dude. And then, uh, so the injury happened and then I realized that, you know, I wasn't going to do the football thing and uh, I was all in on music. So I got more and more into the band thing and uh, I was able to, I'm not going to date myself, but I was able to get into a band that was fairly successful. I realized playing in a small town someplace, not that I, I don't love small towns, but I, you know, as a matter of fact, I really do, but I realized that there was, you know, I was considered sort of a side guy and I uh, really loved to write. And, um, you know, it was kind of reflecting the band, but not quite there. And then I realized, you know, I, I should go to school. And hmm. uh, so, so I went to school and went to a few universities and colleges. And that for music? Out. Yeah, for music, yes. Um, and, um, and, and to be honest, with the help of my father, you know, I was kind of late in the game. So I was able to get a couple of auditions quickly and went to a few places. And it worked out. And at that time, I was into um, jazz fusion music of all things, right? <laughs> I, was, I was into that thing, you know, hence I'm a big snarky puppy fan now. And it was that kind of stuff. And when I went to, to college, they're kind of like, well, you're that jazz fusion guy, so you're going to play in the jazz fusion ensemble and you're going to be busy at that. And that really, really stretched my boundaries because the players there were monsters again, and you have to keep up to their game. So I felt my playing really got up. But it wasn't until. Uh, I had a, a, a composer prof that was uh, amazing, who who really revered, and you know he said that you know I think I think you can you, you know you're a decent writer you can you can you can probably make a go of this. And as a matter of fact, he kind of convinced me to quit school and uh, get into the business. So he was doing uh, jingles. Mm. So typically, I I you know worked with a jingle company and. Uh, with him and it uh, it went under in a period of a couple of months <laughs> and uh so that was a bit of a, a train wreck drop and... out of school join the jingo company <laughs> yeah. and it goes under <laughs> yeah so so that time uh i moved out to vancouver and i kind of uh, wanted to uh pick up anything i could you know as far as gigs were concerned and and it was real tight um and uh, so, you know, I was end up doing, you know, I did things like music for travel videos and, and mm. like, like micro budget, you know, little documentaries and things like that. And I joined another kind of uh, advertising agency, but that was a really, really great, I guess, learning ground. One of the things I did was um, huge Asian community, community out here and they would often do, um, you know, um, Chinese versions of uh, you know, English uh, commercials. And so they would come to me for the one-stop shops, like, hey, can you do the voiceover recording? And hey, can you do the sound design? And hey, can you do the music too? And you know, hey, can you make us lunch kind of thing? And, uh, and, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, and of course, you know, I was, I was certainly desperate sure. at that point. But that's when I kind of hit me, you know, like, man, the music's got a lot of power here because mm. half the time I had no idea. I mean, I can't speak Cantonese or Mandarin and, and it, you know, the general vibe we would speak in emotion you know like we wouldn't talk about you know well, i mean obviously we talked about the hit points of the commercial and things like that but generally it was the feeling you know and however your you know vocabulary and music is everybody's got emotions everyone's got feelings and that was our general connection but it was it it, it really really you know floored me that you know like i've, I've got some power here that mm. that i that i got to be very very careful with. that led to a uh, I was doing some ghostwriting and the composer, so I was working for another composer as him, and I can't tell you who, of course, but... It's just a, such a remarkable <laughs> industry, whether it be like, uh, you know, books or anything like, we they have the humane guy who's established his name, but he also has all the underlings that kind of throw oh, yeah, ideas. It's just absolutely it's remarkable. Yeah. It's just, yeah. And, and people, people would never know, and it's just so, yeah. so interesting. But that's also a job, too, for people that maybe don't want the spotlight or, you know... Absolutely. Just, you know, it's just interesting. There's so much opportunity to some degree in, in the music industry but I'm sorry, continue. I just found Yeah, no, no, but certainly I, I, I consider uh, ghostwriting at that time an apprenticeship. You know, sure, it, it yeah. Was mass, it was massively, massively helpful to my understanding of the, of the whole concept. 
and I submit for uh, usually the way it works in film is uh, I joined the guild, uh, the composer guild out here, um, and they would often put up job postings. And so there which is this... essentially though for, for people that don't know, essentially like a union, correct? Yeah, it's like a union. It doesn't have the power of the union. It's basically a collective guys and girls and 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 various people that that are interested in film music and you have to have some kind of credits kind of to get in but not necessarily you can be once again you can be an apprentice to, to kind of join this thing but often at that time they would put job postings and so anything that was you know that was around town at that time was was listed on this and uh, of course i picked the biggest one there so sure i can do that and uh as if i had a chance so literally a year later i get a call um and say, hey, we saw your demo. We noticed that it had a bunch of pop music in it, and we like that. And um, and one of the things I did part of this, I would produce a lot of bands. Mm. Like I would be so much in forefront, but I would be the guy that would say, you know, bring your, you know, your song to me, and I I would I'll put you something. And and that was c kind of one way that I kept my tech chops current you know mm -hmm. and that was always kind of changing so that was another thing so uh, i'll just briefly touch on that technically technically uh I'm a, I'm a tech nerd and i i i love to experiment and i found that if i could bring a modern sound to my scoring uh that was a big advantage especially at the time as as that that time it was it was kind of emerging uh the modern sound and film scoring mm -hmm. and that certainly helped me along my way so anyways this this one film which i can name is called on the nose and it started uh, dan Aykroyd and, and robbie coltrane and brenda blethen didn't i don't think it got a u.s release but uh it did well in europe uh and in canada things anyways it was a comedy but get this a hundred year old aboriginal head in a jar from malahide that picked the winners of horse races Yes, that's okay. true. <laughs> okay, so, and, and as a later I found out, it was kind of based on the real story. So um, it was uh, interesting. Anyway, so I, they said, hey, we saw, we, we saw your demo, we heard your demo, and uh, we'd like to have a uh, conversation with you. And then I went into this room, the director and the producer, um, Scott Kenny and uh, David Caffrey uh, were there. And uh, they, for lack of a better word, they went out the night prior and a little groggy. And, and uh, so they said, yeah, well, you know, can't tell you much because we don't know much about music, but we know what we like and we know what works and what doesn't. And all we can tell you is that it's got some house music in it and we like John Williams. And it's like, <laughs> oh, oh, okay, I think I can do something with that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I said, well, what they said, well, what we'd like you to do is we'd like you to do a temporary score to one of the scenes that we provide to you. So I said, sure. And uh, at that point, um, I kind of prided myself of being really fast to work. So, you know, I finished it in a couple of days and um, actually probably in a day. And, and then of course I went to go back and say, cause that, at that time, you know, quick time movies and stuff weren't really the thing you'd actually have to load your stuff in uh, their avids you know in their film film editing systems so i showed up and of course uh, the director david wasn't there uh he was doing something else so I was sitting there with the uh, film editor and we started talking and then we started talking about this you know the show and or the movie and then as we're talking because we were a good 45 an hour i realized that what i wrote was just completely wrong like completely wrong i just completely messed up and then uh that's so and then of course they arrive and literally <sighs> the, the whole uh you know editing suite just erupted in people you know and i'm sitting there melting in my chair going oh. and they played back and it was horrible and i realized like realized that it was just not there at all the sensitivity was all wrong and the you know the motion was all wrong it was just plain old bad and they said Thank you, James. Uh, we'll get back to you. We'll get back to you. <sighs> and uh, and so, anyways, uh, and then I came home and, and I went to my, you know, my wife's arms and, and she said, well, now you know what to do. Just do it again. I yeah. Like, I can't do that. The man. wisdom of women, right? <laughs> yeah. Just like, <laughs> I can't do that. I had my shot. You know, you get, you know, you only got one chance in Hollywood. It's just the way it is. <sighs> Not gonna, you're not going to do it again. So I called the producer back and I said, hey, look, you know, now that I know 
just give me another shot. And, uh, and they said, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, so this time it took my time, it took a week and, um, and I got the gig and wow. that was, that was kind of, and that turned into that basically, that was 22 years ago, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and that turned into everything. And my next gig, ironically, as they're mixing this film in one room at the sound mix facility, the dub stage, as we call it, mm -hmm. this is where they put the music and the sound design, all the sound effects and the dialogue together. And, and they essentially create the soundtrack audio wise. Uh, in the next room, there was a cop show series mixing and one of the post supervisors of the person that was in charge of, of the audio of that show kind of wandered into the other main main room said hey what's that about i know and i got an audition for that gig and i was able wow. to get that gig and then and then the floodgates opened and you know and then i haven't been sleeping since essentially <sighs> so, so lucky but yeah um uh, i can't tell you uh, how things have changed because they have changed changed drastically and, and I, I I really do feel that you know every day I'm learning something new mm. about what I do and um, but primarily and this is the wild thing um, film composing is more about listening and understanding than writing music mm. and in what sense I, how, how would you elaborate on that uh, one of the phrases I, I get a lot is you know uh, you speak producer, you know, and, and uh, there is a certain, <laughs> you know, uh, can't remember, I think it was Leonard Cohen who said, you know, talking about music is like dancing about architecture. And it's a very difficult thing to talk about, you know, sure. constructively, you know, it's, it, it, it is math, but at the same time, it's not, you know, art is sure. a very, very thing, right? And Emotional math at that. Even makes yeah, sense, exactly. Right? right. But what I, 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 I find that you know, for example, uh, you know, they can say, well, for this particular scene, I, I, I want it bright at the beginning, and then I kind of want it to thump in the middle, and then I kind of want it to hit you in the face at the end, and then, but, you know, be sure to try to help her performance along, which means you want it, you know, you, you want it delicate and uh, you don't want to take this character and you and you want to waft her out and then you want to make her really really aggressive and you know it, again it's just interpreting what they say and the longer you work with somebody you kind of get mm. that connection where you understand you know without saying much what's there and you know ultimately you know i'm i'm the slave to the filmmakers and i have to be that's my job right i'm a slave and the interesting thing is once you kind of get in the pocket the movie kind of starts writing itself you know like score wise because it yeah, simply sure. di dictates what you can do once you come up with themes and your motifs and what you're going to do here and then what there you know as long as you listen to the creative people involved it will guide you you know and i find that it's that communication that i guess here's the thing you know the most most important thing is trust and we talked about it before how much power you've got with score is incredible right you know you can abuse that very 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 easily you know like here's your here's your you know 30 million dollar picture you know don't screw up you know it's you have to win trust you know, that's, Absolutely. The, that's some of the best. It, it kind of translates into performance as well. Some of the best performers out there are the ones that can technically do everything. They yeah. know very much so when to hold back and when to, for lack of a better term, shred. Right. Yes. You know, it's, it's all about it's all about self-control or discipline and knowing when to use that, you know. Yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, for lack of a better word, you know, it's just maturity to, to understand. When sure. To push. And uh, but that trust is huge. And of course, the longer you work with a certain group of people, the more you gain that trust. And, and, you know, one of the projects I'm working on now, whereas, you know, we just, we have this wonderful meeting at the beginning, which is called the spotting session. We, we decide what and where and who and what gets music. And, you know, it just can, kind of says like, well, how are you feel? Make it work. Just make it work. And I was like, okay, I can do that. But, you know, there's a standard. And if I don't, fit that standard if it doesn't make me happy it sure as hell is not going to make them happy right mm -hmm. so and it's all about trust and and, it's, and as far as getting gigs are concerned it is about creating and, and getting that trust and once you get it you know you, you ain't going to abuse it man it's it's your baby right and, and your next job your next job will dictate 
you know how much you you're how how successful you are at, at that trust sure at this yeah. point in your career you, you mentioned um kind of like backtracking a couple of points that you talked about in, in this journey uh at this point you are uh, or when you first started you were doing a lot of um you know audition work at this point is it still a lot of auditions or is it a lot of like you know relational like hey i have this you know gig would you be interested in you know trying yeah out so that, that's a that's a really really uh interesting question like um for the folks i haven't worked for before i mean most things now um uh, um actually the exception of a few they kind of come to me and and they say you know we're interested in you are you interested in submitting and by submitting uh that means that um we prep a playlist of some cues that we think that would be appropriate for the, the project in what sense of pre things like like songs already made or you make songs for it or how does that work yeah so so that's uh, uh, coming to that so songs already done cue okay. we call them cue, we call them film cues which are usually anywhere from like one and a half to three minutes kind of thing and that's for usually people who aren't unfamiliar with my my work um and and uh which is nearly everybody <laughs> and uh um <laughs> But no, uh, seriously. And then, um, oh, they would. Uh, the other factor that's huge in that is my my agent, who uh, you know uh, is a fairly large agency, and uh, they get you know kind of the first calls for what's going on, and, and they kind of decide who's right for uh, the project. And often they'll put together these demo reels without even me knowing, hmm. and uh, and then it's a call. And then, um, and this is the interesting part. Usually the the then they can ask you to do very very much like I did when I first did uh, that first film is do a demo to picture itself. So there is a double edged sword. Um, on the one hand, if they don't know you or know your work or what you can do, it's a great way for them to get to know you. On the second hand, the very first cue in any project is by far the hardest thing to ever come up with. Absolutely. You have to you have to analyze everything. And a lot of the times that is also an exercise uh, to which the creators of the show to, to get ideas. So it's kind of like a, a fishing expedi expedition where hmm. it's not only just to get the right person uh, attached to the project, but it's also to understand, well, hey, there's an angle that we didn't consider. We kind of like that angle too. Absolutely. But the drag is, uh, so, you know, if I was new to the business, I wouldn't do that. I would do that in a heartbeat. I would just say, yeah, you know, like I'm hungry. I got to do it. Um, and, and now, um, unless it's a really big thing, I wouldn't consider doing that. Uh, just because a, the amount of time, um, I'm, as I said, I'm fortunate to be very busy, uh, which usually means I have a couple of projects at least at one time going on. And I'll talk about that in a bit. Yikes. Uh, and, um, that it just takes an enormous, it's not fair one to the project because unless I'm completely committed to it, I won't have the time or the energy to go in there and do it. And I have to carve up my schedule in order to do that. And two, uh, it, it's just, you know, it's, it's kind of a fairness thing. It's kind of a, you know, like they don't ask a director to go out and do a temporary directoring demo of the film mm -hmm. or, or a cinematographer to go out and do, hey, you know, the movie's about mushrooms. Why I want to take, can you go take a bunch of pictures of mushrooms and send sure. it to me? You know, that just doesn't happen. And also it's, uh, I'll say this delicately and politely, it's also ignorance as to the, the amount of time and effort it takes to do something sure. like that. And I'm, I'm not criticizing that regard. It's just saying that, you know, like uh, getting back to time on, uh, you know, for a Netflix series, for example, um, and it's a good schedule. I've got about 10 days from when we talk about it to when I have to deliver it to be to the stage. Mm -hmm. And in that 10 days, uh, there's prep and everything. So I'm actually fact i got about six to seven days and in those six to seven days i can i have to write anywhere from 25 to an hour's worth of music so it's wow. like doing it's doing like an album's worth of stuff produced mixed ready to go in six days so it, it's nuts it's nuts right and of course the more you do that the better you get at it but it is a machine and you know i have helpers along the way as far as editors and things like that but you know it's it's an enormous amount of energy and time how do you and, find the ability to stay creative with the, those time constraints because you know sometimes yeah. creativity leads you down rabbit holes but you also have the the time constraint of oh i need this done in four more days how do you find that balance <laughs> 
You know, that's an excellent question. As far uh, I find, um, find me drawing on my education a lot, you know, like for certain techniques, certain styles, uh, I find my inspiration in uh, new sounds, new palettes. I found my inspiration in looking like I'm constantly viewing uh, new movies, new series, inspired constantly by the work of other folks. Uh, it's amazing, amazing stuff out there. Um, and, and that, you know, I said, well, why don't we try that? But it also depends on uh, if we're lucky enough to have an orchestra or if we're, you know, a, a group of musicians can come in. That dictates a lot of things. But if it's just me, you know, um, playing my various instruments by myself, I want to say, okay, occasionally, um, the inspirational part, I'm very, very fortunate where writing music is like a muscle. The more you do it, the easier it gets, the quicker it becomes. Sure. And boom, boom, boom. And, you know, if I find that I go away with that, like when I went away for holidays, it took me like a good two, three days to figure stuff out, man. It was, it was, it was harsh. And, and that's always the case because you, your, your brain is, is in that mode. Yeah. But I, I like, interesting, I did this one show where the producer, said you know it was a cop show again and producer said okay no guitars in this one no guitars said, okay it's a cop show man no guitars <laughs> and you know it forced me to think out of the box sure so, so I'll, I'll make those rules to myself where you know like <laughs> we ain't gonna have any french horns in this one you know and and that kind of idea or i want to really you know um intimate sound in that regard so like i can only use and then uh, for example there's this composer named olafur arnolds who, who i adore and his deal is and he said something profound recently which was you know we all get obs obsessed with the latest sounds and libraries and everything else like that and he said well limit yourself to five things and see what yeah. you can come up you know and you you'd be amazed how how you know um for example, I'm working with another fellow named Sean Watkins, who's brilliant uh, guitarist, who's in the band called Nickel Creek, and got a bunch of Emmys, uh, sorry, Grammys, Emmys, Grammys, what's the difference, right? <laughs> and, you know, he's he's primarily a singer-songwriter, plays guitar, plays mandolin, a bunch of instruments, but mostly stringed. And he'll, he'll help out with the score in this one show, and it's astounding how, you know, essentially... For that show, it's mandolin and guitar, and acoustic guitar, and sometimes yeah. electric. But those three instruments, how different and interesting he could make them sound every time. And I, I find that just incredible, you know. So anyways, it's hard to do, but if you set rules and limitations on yourself, hmm. it's easy to mix it up. But that being yeah. said, like if I get a new sound library that is wicked, you know, like I'm a big fan of a company called Slate Nash out in the UK, and they just produced something that, uh, choreographs is just stupid you know it's yeah just... absolutely being that you're a tech nerd i'm curious to hear some of the stuff mm -hmm. like going down this rabbit hole a little bit what, what are some things mm -hmm. that you enjoy using some whether it be soft synths or real synths or plugins or you know i'm curious to hear your your perspective on this as a tech nerd myself this is now an indulgent question <laughs> uh, absolutely yeah so um uh i i kind of grew up in the in in the the, the end of the analog age the very end of it you know and so i kind of grew up through big mixing consoles and things like that and uh using using outboard gear exclusively and analog mm. stuff so i had the benefit of that world but i jumped on the digital wagon as soon as it kind of happened you know very 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 young i would have been geez eight or nine at the time you know <laughs> like it was it was a really interesting thing and and um anyways uh I I totally got in the digital thing. Now, everything from a film score point of view, when you're it's just yourself doing a series or a couple of people in the box using plugins and everything is, is far more um, uh, preferable just because it's instant recall of everything. You know, that being said, all of my um, stuff that I get in there, if I record tracks, uh, like I will always use... Uh, real instruments whenever I can and uh, so I'll record those quickly uh, through analog very nice analog uh, outboard gear coming into the system you know most of the time too uh, I'll use uh, uh, plugins and you know even for for uh, effects uh, however I do have a, a few things that I just adore using um, I am a synth guy. One of the mm. things that my dad counted on me for was 
he would get a synthesizer and ask me to figure it out to teach him, you know. And that started with a, a Juno 60, a Roland Juno 60. Back That's in the day. amazing. Yeah, instead of a 106, it was the actual original Juno. Uh, and that, you know, and as you can see, the various flashing lights behind me, uh, you know, I use analog synths all the time. And uh, uh, I can't tell you who, but uh, there is this one uh, director um, that his idea of a pitch of his idea, he would create storyboards and pitch his idea to the network or the studio using these storyboards and he asked you asked me to create a soundtrack for these storyboards and this one particular project was completely 80s based and i i i just said okay i'm going to be completely old school obviously i'm using my computer to record but um uh, i'll I'll exclusively use MIDI through this stuff, you know, and all outboard gear. And it was the most amazing experience ever. Yeah. And, as, and because of that, I'm using a lot of, basically, I, I think I use, on every score, I use the, the, the analog sense. They're just much fun. And they're all interconnected now with the system uh, through USB or, but a lot of the times, like, i got a couple of modulars. It's hilarious reading, like, the notes. It's like, hey. You know, this goes in oscillator one and this goes to lfo2 yeah you know so but and again that's all time and if if i'm yeah. producing a band which i still do occasionally it's such a wonderful way to be inspired and again you were talking about inspiration that that's a huge thing of inspiration you know like a, yeah you know some of my comp the great composers that that i that i idolize uh that's their thing. You know, Hans is, is fantastic at that in his group of folks. So it's They're, really interesting how you're saying that, that, and I agree, that creating limitations on, on what you do actually leads to creativity mm -hmm. while also being productive, you know, being able to get a Netflix show scored in a week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, it's ridiculously stupid. But, you know, <laughs> in, in uh, you know, you're, I'm always looking, you know, and it, it can come from anywhere. It's like, uh, you know, just recently, uh, uh, you know, giving you the size of my my sample libraries um, and uh, for those kind of just learning, um, essentially for orchestral work uh, specifically, I'm drawing a lot of the orchestral stuff uh, via samples, via, you know, essentially when you hit a keyboard, you, you, you trigger a sound of a French horn. Mm -hmm. Well, the more, more, more data you have in that recording, the more realistic it can sound. And nowadays mm. it's getting really, really good to, to hear the difference from a lay person series between a, a real orchestra and a fake one and the, you know there's amazing uh companies doing orchestral recording but of course you need you know some serious computer strength and some serious computer space in order to do this so uh over the holidays in, in one of my rigs uh we put in a raid system using it was called nvme or flash drives so on this one card we we're able to put four of these nvmes which uh have a speed of eight thousand megabytes per second wow and then raid them together four times so there's now 32 <laughs> 32 000 megs a second for via data transfer and the wild thing is is that we've got uh, three of them in this one rig and so uh i can literally call up a completely different orchestral template which usually takes about eight to ten minutes of load so i have wow. one but now through this thing it's like a fraction of that time it's nuts it's nuts right and just that itself so like before inspirationally like well i couldn't call up this you know string section because i 100 percent. yeah you know it's just that and it saves me half an hour an hour a day you know and that just opens yeah. up a whole door of things yeah so. it's really 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 interesting uh, you're speaking my language with this in the sense that like <laughs> i find um you know, like the, the productivity really important, you know, and mm -hmm. it's like, it's really interesting to see how much of an inhibitor it is for me to like record a guitar if I don't have it already mic'd up. Yeah. You know, or to yeah. be like, oh, my pedal board's not out. So now like, I don't want to, you know, I'm, I'm recording, I'm recording, I have everything right here. This, the analog synth here. I have, you know, whatever. Oh, mm -hmm. I got to go in and get the pedal board, plug it in, tune up the guitar. It's like, it totally breaks the creative flow. And now I yeah. don't do it. You know what I mean? So the, the yeah. song then doesn't have electric guitar, you know, or, yes. or, or it does, and I'm total. Then I'm like lost the inspiration. You know what I mean? So it's really interesting um, to see how much you know, even as you speaking, like the, how how important it is like when you have the the luxury of being able to afford it, right? You know, at, at, yeah, and it's yeah. and it's really interesting to follow the journey of whether it be your journey or any musician's journey of starting out 
okay, like I didn't have any luxuries, so everything was took forever. It took forever to do anything because I had, you know, there was had barely had any space in my computer. My computer was slow, you know, yeah, like yeah, all these yeah. things. And then you slowly, slowly move up, and I think that's a really important thing to talk about in the sense that you. You know, in hearing your story, um, mm-hmm. you know, you started out from, you know, doing so many different things in the music industry, but also starting out auditioning and the audition mm-hmm. process took a long time. You know, it wasn't it, you know, even to create the, you know, the time putting in for that. And then because mm-hmm. so many people, I think, uh, look at where you are now and be like, well, that's where I want to be. OK, well, yeah, but you didn't put in 25 years of work, you know, and it took 25 yeah. years ago. <laughs> Mm-hmm. When he was, you know, you weren't working at the speed. You didn't have 32,000, you know, megabits a second. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But it's true, though. And I think that's really important to be, you know, I say all the time, you know, people all my, watch my videos like, wow, the, the, it looks your studio looks sick. I'm like, yeah, thank you. But now go back six months and look what it looked like then. Go back six months from there, look like it would look like that. And I've been doing this for years. Look, go back five years ago and look what and it looked like. And you're constantly then. thinking about how to make it better, right? Exactly. Oh. So I'm like, if you want to start something, like I say all the time, I want to start a vid. People say, I want to start a channel. Like, what do you recommend? Like, what gear? I'm like, okay, cool. Go back and look at some of my first videos and try to copy that. Because, like, that's where I was. That's what I started. I started on my iPhone, filming everything on my iPhone. You know, like, it's... And that, people just want where you are now. But it's like, okay, cool. I posted 6,000 videos. Then we can, like, talk. You know what I mean? (laughs) So it's... (laughs) Yeah, I hear you. Um, you. And it's not even... It's just... It's it's just you got to put in the time. And it's the recognizing that. So I find that super fascinating. But segue getting into one I want to... I'm super curious about this. Because as a Mm. musician myself and as somebody that does a lot of film work, not necessarily movies or anything like that, but, like, I do Mm -hmm. a lot of video, right? Mm. It's really interesting to see how much that affects me as a viewer or a listener. Mm-hmm. So, for example, mm-hmm. even like yesterday, I was watching something with my wife, and I was like, "How do you think the acting is? This? It kind of feels like a little bit like what do you like it? Is it too much?" He's like, "I don't even think about this stuff, you know." But I, as somebody that makes film stuff, I do. So I'm really curious to hear your perspective on um, how being in the industry of making film movie, like music for film or TV mm-hmm. show, affects you as a viewer. Wow. Uh... It's, it's wild, you know, whenever somebody asks about what I do, you know, Department of Motor Vehicles or something. I write music for movie and TV. So, oh, that must be great. I never even thought, I, like, you know, then they say, yeah, I, guess there, I guess there is background music there. You know, and that's, that's a wonderful compliment to a lot of folks. Mm. Ideally, we we're talking about pushing and pulling and, and the maturity and the taste aspect of of music and how to go there. Often when uh, I work on a on a project, uh, it, it's, it's interesting. It's all intertwined. You you tend to to uh, get 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 into a conversation. Like, for example, I worked on this one project where uh, they said, "James, uh, we need you to help this scene. We need you to help the scene. The performances are terrible. <laughs> the direction is terrible." And we really need you to help it out and make it work. And, uh, you know, a classic example would be an action scene. You know, it's like it's re- this thing is really flat. We need you to sp- make it urgent. And, and it's hilarious. If you ever watch any kind of action sequence or an action film without music, it's quite hilarious and, and lets us, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's true, man. And, and so, so, well, it depends how it's done. But in, in general, music that uh, shows that are highly reliant on, um, on music are, are that way. But so it's amazing, uh, getting back to the power of what you can do, uh, you know, 20 years ago when I jumped on to scoring a film, I thought about what I would want to hear and try to flex my muscles musically so I said mm. the music sounded great. But I missed the fact that was I actually serving the scene? You know, was I actually serving? You know, it's it's, it's, it's more like a religion where, you know, I, I, am I serving, you know, what it is this this, this piece of art is, right? Getting back to that, that one scene where, or that one scene where it needed all this help i would approach that two ways you know many years back i would have just put a pulsing thing through there and 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 went to 10. now i still put that pulsing thing there but i really think about the hit points of each sequence and when i talk about hit points getting back to you know often when i speak with producers and directors it's we speak the language of emotion Mm -hmm. Uh, you know like what is this character feeling or what do we hope this character to uh, to to feel at this point and that really drives where and what and how hard i want to pitch 
push. And particularly comedy is really hard with that. You know, there's the, 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 the you know, comedies are, are an incredible, you know, education in sensitivity. When I say that, you know, is it slapstick? Is it, mm. you know, tongue in cheek? You know, is it smirking? You know, that all of these levels of understanding and uh, are, are fascinating to pull. And then there's other things too, like if you look at, um, um, the movie Dune, for example, which I'm a fan of, uh, Denny, uh, uh, the um, director, his most in impressive choices are the choices where he just decides to play a certain, when I say play, play certain th aspects of the audio. For example, um, you know, you, you have this incredible mach machine taking off and all of these visuals that you know promote this this incredible soundscape of sounds but yet he just decides to play the sound of you know his his, his like his one specific sound effect above everything and likewise in music he'll suck everything out and just have music or dialogue it's just a quite a question of the power of taking away stuff and the power of silence is is a focus. I guess that's the best way to, to say it. You know, Miles said, like, you know, it's like, this is what the guy don't play. It makes it great. You know, Miles Davis, uh, the trumpet player. And what it was, what he meant was is simply, you know, it's listening and taking your focus on a certain time and taking it away. That is the coolest and the hardest thing to master. Of course, you have to understand when you're dealing with like movie Dune or, you know, uh, you know, uh, 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 an indie film or whatever it is, there's different levels of, of your focus and some mm. the simpler genre dictates what you're going to do, you know. So there's all these factors as to what you can and what you can't do. But I, the ultimate rule that I have is, am I serving the film? And getting back to the, the uh, unspoken narrator of the film, which is what I feel the, the score is. If you can get to the point where, you know, Someone says to you, well, you know, I didn't, I didn't notice the music, but boy, that scene made me cry, you know? Mm -hmm. Sure. And, and when you don't no notice the score and it invokes that emotion in, in you, I say chalk one up for the film composer there because yeah. that is the ultimate in, in letting you know that, hey, you know, I affected or whoever's writing affected you and it felt natural enough that you didn't notice what was mm -hmm. happening were just involved in the storytelling because ultimately that's what i do i just i'm a storyteller i just happen to do with music right yeah. and so as a viewer do you then like say is it hard to turn that off be like oh i would have done this differently or this is interesting how they did that is oh, it's all terrible. you're listening is it all you're listening for oh it's terrible it's terrible like yeah <laughs> i mean like i analyze things so terribly you know unfortunately i gave that to my kids um oh. and, and you know um, and, uh, particularly my youngest, who's a, uh, you know, budding, budding writer, screenwriter guy. And, uh, he, you know, unfortunately he's, his analyzing of, of scenes are, are beyond my measure, man. He's just, he's in a different, different league. And, um, you know, he will deconstruct things from a story point of view. That's what he listens to. Mm. That's what he, he, he understands the characters. He understands the dialogue between them. He understands the jeopardy stakes in the scene, you know, where, and then because of me, he notices the score, you know, and likewise, I'm learning to, to notice story more. Like, mm. you know, back in the day, uh, it, it's, it's akin to being a musician. When I ever listened to a, a great song that was happening, I never listened to the lyrics. I never listened to the lyrics. <laughs> sure. I listened to the melodies. I listened to, you know, um, yeah. uh, I listened to the chord structure. I listened to the rhythms. And now, you know, many, many, many years later, uh, that's that's all I listen to. Like, I'm listening to some of the tracks that, you know, like uh, we did in one show, we did a remix of a Peter Gabriel tune and astounded by his lyrics. Like, just mm. Out. it just hit me right in the heart bone man and and i i i never even thought about it I've heard yeah. the song all my life you know yeah uh, and you just realize it so yes it affects everything i do when i watch a film the first thing i noticed uh <laughs> like for example was that predator uh prequel i think it was called prey that was it i knew in the first literally minute that i was going to enjoy the film because they had all these great choices and that's essentially uh as a filmmaker you look for, you know, um, 
when and where to have music, how the sound sounds, mm. how the sound design is affecting you, how the choices visually are affecting you. You know, I knew in the first minute that I was going to like the film because the sensitivity that was working for me in this film, all of those choices were done. And there was a good dozen of them in the first minute of the film. And I realized, oh, okay, I'm in, I'm all in here, you know? Yeah. And, but, you know, um, anyways, it was one of those things where you, the, the longer you get at anything, the, the, the quicker you realize what you did and what you don't do. And also what you're good at and what sure. you're not. But I, I torment people because, yeah, man, he would should have went to the subdominant minor there. That would have worked out much better for him. It's very, it's also, <laughs> I, I think it's very comparable to a songwriter in the sense of like, it's very, probably very few in between where you watch a movie and you don't think much about the the, the soundtrack, you know, if ever, right? You know, yeah. compared to yeah. like, as a songwriter, it's like, one out of every 500 songs i'm not thinking about the music and it's like and then I, and then after i was like oh shoot that song rocked that yeah, that yeah. was it that's you know and it's yeah. like there's yeah. one like a very very few but then they hit that hits and there's like i'm not even thinking about anything i'm not thinking about the lyrics but i'm just like this song is so good and yeah that yeah. those are yeah. special special moments in time when when you're you know it, it, when you do this for a living right yeah yeah no you you tend to the great part happens when you start to really let like, something that was right in front of you all along, you kind of go, Oh, dude, <laughs> you know, yeah. and you, you figure it out, you know, and, yeah. and, and that, that is a great, great thing. You know, also it's, you know, when I listen to my older stuff, I go like, what were you thinking? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just, it's but just, alternatively yeah. though, it's really interesting. I, I, I would bet I'd venture to bet, uh, based on conversations and on personal experience, well, you might say for ninety percent of the stuff, like, oh man, what were you thinking? There were these really rare but also amazing gems in like ten percent of your work back then. Yes, yes. Which absolutely. I find fascinating as a creative because so often we discount beginner work. You know, especially as, a, as someone people are beginners, they say, you know, like I'm writing. I'm not like, how do I become better? I'm like, just keep writing and. Yeah probably one out of 10 songs, one out of 15, 20 songs is actually really good. And you'll probably keep performing that for the rest of your life. Like yeah, it's absolutely. really fascinating how, how that happens, you know? And of course, the more you do it, the better you get. And the less the ratio flips from bad songs to good songs. Yeah. But it's, yeah. it's very interesting to, cause you'll still write a bad song as a professional, you know, it's, or, you know, it's, oh, I never, it's never wrote a bad song. Like yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's no. really interesting to, to, as a songwriter, not to discount everything because, mm -hmm. um, you know, you do, like you said, you, we have, there were some scores you would like, well, how did I do that? You know what I mean? I yeah, wouldn't know yeah. how to do that today. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. No, well, it's also, you're, you know, you've got to be somewhat of an OCD narcissist, right? <laughs> uh, you, 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 you've got to be your worst critic, you know, like mm. my, my oldest son, you know, he's uh, producing a, another album right now. Um, great, great guitar player. He is the most meticulous, critical thing ever. Like I, I can't even, I can't even, understand it unfortunately that comes directly from me right so <laughs> it's, it's it's but you really need a healthy dose if you look at anybody that who who's successful at what they do you need us you need to be your worst critic sure you know you look you look at uh anybody playing basketball or football or whatever it's you know they they yeah i played great but i did this wrong you know sure I mean, you know and yeah. in music the, the amazing part about music is hmm. music is you know, you're trying to reach something that essentially can never be perfect, I guess mm -hmm. you could say, you know, you're always wanting to do something better. You know, certainly if you're a classical musician, like if you're trying to perform, you know, Rachmaninoff, you'll, you'll never get perfection. And that's why performers keep on wanting to, to do that. Likewise, you know, if, if you're a singer, you know, you're always judging, you know, people may say, hey, I did you know, you, you, you come up and you said, Hey, you, you were amazing tonight. But when that person, when, you know, they, they'll come home and they'll know exactly how they did, you know, they'll yeah, judge themselves. Yeah. And, it's and that I think it's you know. super important to find that balance because otherwise you will go and you will, oh, yeah. you, you'll quit music. You'll yeah, quit music. Yeah. yeah learn yeah, learn to be like, okay, this is good enough. Cause otherwise yeah, you'll be a yeah. miserable person to be around. <laughs> yeah. And, and especially, especially when the time factor kicks in, man, it's just like, sure. Yeah, okay. My, my yeah. dad had you know, I had a phrase. It was kind of funny. Sounded like uh, "close enough for rock and roll, great for country." You know, <laughs> oh my <laughs> and, gosh, and, which is a terrible don't, thing to say. And, don't tell the country people that. <laughs> it, well, no. I, ironically, you know, one of the shows I'm doing now is, is very is very country, right? You know, sure. and, and believe me, I I'm astounded at at, at that genre, at, at that quality of music. That's coming sure. Out. 
sure. but you know as that's a jazz right. musician at the time you know that's what he would say you know and 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 uh, so but anyways at the same time too uh that inner voice of saying how you're you're getting across you need you need support behind you you know uh, um you know i have a, a great group of folks that i bang things off of and, mm. and, and that's really helpful to me you know as mm -hmm. a kid I had someone who, when I had no idea what I was doing, and that was difficult for my father, you know, because my father, he kind of wanted me to be a musician at the same time. He kind of wanted me to be a ball player, and, and, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a difficult thing. So he, he kind of just let me decide things for myself. But I would bounce things off of folks, and they would tell me, that's great. You should work on this you know for example that one uh, composer professor he was he was very blunt you know and said janitor shoot this sucks but this is great you know and you got to work on this and that is so helpful to also to have the humility for understanding when you can be better sure you, know, you got to work on and that discipline to practice and to work it out and to recognize where you need help you know like uh Believe you me, you know, every day I, I say to myself, you know, why didn't you spend from, you know, a few more years in the piano lab, you know, just practicing and you know, it's really killing me now. Right. Um, <laughs> and so yeah. so that the humility through discipline, through understanding you're constantly it's that drive of trying to get something through. And music is the epitome of that. You mm -hmm. know, you are always, always trying to make yourself better, always trying to look for yeah. the next next groove the next the next hook the next lyric the next anything you know and film music is just an extension of that. so I, I really appreciate all this this insight and i and, and wrapping it up i have a few more questions for you but one one question i want to talk about is the fact of i'm really curious to see like obviously the music the, mu the movie industry and t film industry and tv show industry has changed significantly over the years and how it's being consumed mm -hmm. especially with the whole short form content Creation, you know, the creation of short form, short form content, whether it be YouTube or you know TikTok, like anything from in that whole sphere of, of, of content, right? So I'm really, which is very different than like you know going to Blockbuster 25 years ago, you know, and even before, you know, right? It's it's, it's the industry is shifting for sure, and I'm really curious Absolutely. to see um, with that whole streaming shorter form content, if at all, if it, if you've seen it affect the music inside of um, inside of film or or movies or if you're still creating the same way that you did 25 years ago with, or, I, if I'm curious to see if it's affected it or not at all. That's kind of the question. Okay. Well, that's a great question. Um, absolutely. It has without, uh, I guess the concept is still there. Essentially you're expected to do more in a finished state than ever before. For example, very interesting. Yeah. Uh, for example, let's take that first film I did, you know, it was 22 years ago. Uh, I did it all by myself, did it all by myself in my, you know, my DAW, essentially at my, my workstation, playing various instruments. But when I finished, I put it on a, you know, I mixed it on an analog desk and I put it on a digital audio tape. And then that digital audio tape, I had to get to the editor, assistant editor, and then the assistant editor had to digitize that. And then from that digitize, the editor had to put it up against picture. And it was nuts, right? You know, like you really didn't know. You kind of had an idea. Now, we're talking about this 10 day, that 10 day turnaround with Netflix. So here's the thing. So this, this one show that I'm doing right now, um, they shot it in uh, in at, in Atlanta, and um, of course they shot it in the summer. In summer, Atlanta means cicadas, um, oh. and uh, so most of the scenes are are noisy as hell. So, anyways, getting keep that in mind. So now, when I present, the way it works is we talk about the film. It's called a spotting session, spotting session, and we we go down to the exact frame of where music comes in, music comes out, oh. and off, often they will use my uh, score that I've produced before, the assistant editors will go through or the editors will go through the existing cut of the film and put in my previous score or a temporary score, we call it, uh, to give them an idea of what's going on. But it's a good indication as to when the cue starts and the, when the music stops in, this, in a particular scene. So that's great. Now, and then they'll say, we'll talk about it and we want to change this. We like this, but we don't like this. But, okay, we need you to let us know what's going on. So we, A, we have that meeting now. We used to have that meeting in person. We still mm -hmm. do now occasionally, but now it's a Zoom thing. Um, 
And but they, you know, I would have you know clients rolling up my drive and my neighbors were like, "Hey, I know that guy," and and um, <laughs> but now that happens less and less. You know, uh, now it's mostly it's certainly because of the pandemic, things have changed sure. in that regard. What I will do is, um, I will produce the music, write the music, produce the music, mix the music. Now, normally, uh, I I would get. Uh, the music editor to do the next step, which is we talked about cicadas before. So the dialogue track is terrible in the film because it's full of noise and cicadas. And you can't hear what the dialogue is. So we'll actually have to go, and this is this is usually a team of twenty people, clean up all the dialogue, add some basic sound effects and underneath, so you hear what's going on, so it doesn't feel like like it's there. So this process itself that takes about a day to do and then you take my, the, my music and the clean dialogue track and some temporary sound effects so it doesn't feel hollow and wooden and you mix it together and essentially you mix a completed film albeit with a temporary uh, uh, dialogue fixing and sound design but you yourself are making an, a complete movie as to what you would see on very close to what you would see on screen in the final product just as a demo to the producers sure you know and on top of that uh, they will give notes saying hey, we like this here but i'd like to change that so then i change that we mix a whole movie again we output the whole movie uh and by the way when you're doing the movie you have to basically have the same skills as a film editor and then as as you know you know you're not on top of your on top of your music chops you got to be a, a a video dude too as well <laughs> you know and you got to know about how that's all going on and then and then that gets uploaded again to uh, a secure site uh sure. where you know they they ask you essentially you know what you have for lunch and they do know what you have for lunch <laughs> as you're uploading and that's that's all there uh the other incredible point was um i did a movie not too long ago where uh we uh we needed an orchestra and um it was a large project and we didn't have the quite the budget to do it. So what happens often now is that uh, folks uh, in the east of Europe, there's amazing orchestras out there that are specifically all day long just doing film music and they're wow. done online. So what we'll do is is I'll do a mock-up orchestration of something using my synths and stuff. And it sounds, in all honesty, you know, it sounds pretty good. You know, forgive me if I say so, but it, it sounds like an orchestra. Those tracks are sent to... Uh, you know, uh, a copyist and arranger, and then I have my editor uh, prepare that session for the orchestra. And then I have a camera basically looking at looking at the orchestra and uh, somebody speaking in, in, in Polish and uh, conduct an orchestra. And literally, uh, it is one tenth the cost, and uh, it's an orchestra. And that's, that's remarkable. How, that's how most things are done now on, on Netflix, as far as um, most or orchestral stuff uh, that you see uh and and it's done in an afternoon you know yeah. and these folks and and you know to be honest with you you know uh the symphony orchestra industry has been struggling but this is this has saved them you know wow and and the players are fantastic fantastic sure. so you know and uh so you so again and this is just starting from you know i don't have to travel to that country i don't have to speak polish you know it's mm. just like it's all it's all there you know but that and, all being uh, said the level of how much you have to produce now it like the speed of which now we produce is, yes. is much faster yeah that's super interesting yeah yeah it's it's wild but it, you know before i gave them you know a multi-track you know digital audio tape and i just sent it off to the dub station hope it kind of worked yeah you know yeah. and and uh but there's folks you know we were talking john williams again to an analog you know my dad the same way as like that guy could be sitting down on an airplane and you know write 62 parts while having a scotch in the corner of a plane you know and do it in his head <laughs> and it, it was amazing every time and, and and so that it's just you know i guess as humans we evolve all the time we were we do what sure. we're given to but it's it's incredible how things are changing it yeah. and the only thing that concerns me now is is the uh uh, I kept on telling everybody, you know, for schools out in Canada, at least the first things that get kicked away are the music programs and the art programs. And I'm telling everybody that, you know, that's the last thing that's going to be left to take over from AI. And uh, 
and and and, and so that that's a huge factor too now but uh very you know, very interesting dude actually in yeah, fact yeah. after this i was about to film a video like somebody uh one of my subscribers typed in like write a song for jacob restituto that talks about blank and the ai yeah. wrote the song so i was gonna yeah, be like yeah. you know i was gonna make a video on that and it's just it's it's yeah it's wild. fascinating it's wild it's, uh, it's fascinating but i'm i'm still having hope out for humanity that sure. i see i see it kind of coming you know my youngest son is a, is a fortunately he's a really good chess player and it pisses me off but <laughs> you know he he tells me you know uh like you know you, you can't be a computer at chess you can't but what you can do is now with chess tournaments they have it's a combination between humans and computers together as teams you know and, and that's kind of what I see it going, where I see it going, where it is a fusion between those two things. So I guess we all need brain implants eventually. And, <laughs> you know, um, I mean, I is, that, that yeah. is that any yeah. different than technically it's the cell phone, the human computer combined, right? You know, now it's exactly. just even smarter, right? Hey, you yeah. know how many times I have Siri remind me to do things? You know, it's my, it's my personal <laughs> assistant. Siri is my personal yeah. assistant, right? I hear you. I hear you. You know, hey Siri, turn off the lights. You know? Oh no! Now it's gonna turn off for everybody that's listening. <laughs> gotcha. Oh, that's too and funny. I turn my own up. I turn uh, my own up. You... Hey Siri, turn funny. on lights. Yeah. <laughs> Just to piss you off. That's Sorry, so funny. No, I love that. I'm looking around to see if anything turned off. In conclusion, though, I like to ask everybody that have on the channel. Um, one of my favorite questions to ask is, uh, now that you've been doing this, you know, and. Uh, for, for how, however long you've been doing it, right? What yeah. is one thing that you know now that you wish you knew when you first started out? Well, one, how much does it pay? No, I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, no. That's uh, funny. It's the art of listening. The art of listening. Mm. As you can tell from this interview, I'd love to ramble. Uh, but if the more I can listen, the more successful I would be. The more humility I have, the better I'm going to be. Mm. Uh, and in film, it's extraordinarily important where, you know, when I originally said to you, film composing is less, less about writing music and more about understanding the film, you yeah. know, uh, and you understand the film. Like, for example, uh, just did this thing where, where, you know, the folks were living with it for a year and a half before it came to me. And they know it intimate. And I show up going, hey, how's it going? I like, I like to write music for your film. And they go like, hey. I got to win their trust. B, I really got to understand this project. I really yeah. got to make this film even before I can consider to write a note. Before I was, you know, coming back to my very first gig, it's like, yeah, okay, no problem. Here's some house music, you know, and, and it's completely inappropriate. So it's that getting back to what we talked about before, a certain sense of maturity is understanding what you're doing and holding back is as important as, as throwing it down. In yeah. some cases, in, in, in music, it's, you know, I'm the king of the 96 track cue, unfortunately, whereas <laughs> I put three instruments together and it's, it's way more powerful. And I have to stop myself to say, well, you know, does that extra French horn do its thing here? You know, I was like, no, 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 I'm missing it out. So be, be your best critic within reason. Yeah. But knowing that, knowing that laying back, uh, I wish I did that more as a younger guy. So. Absolutely, it's interesting, man. It's it's absolutely very very true. Same thing with yeah, especially as a producer, you know, making your own music, you want to throw everything, sprinkle it yeah. all in there, right? You know, look at me, look, look, look mom, look what I can do, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and now exactly. it's like that's the beauty of you know and so many things though too like even in film like you some of the most simple simplest shots are these you know very or most amazing shots are the more simple is what i'm trying to say you know so yeah absolutely it's remarkable. absolutely well i really yeah. really appreciate your time i thank you so much for taking the time i know that you, you mentioned that you've got a lot going on so the fact that I was, <laughs> as, I, as i was listening i'm like man this is an honor to speak with him as he's as talking about all the things he's going on so i appreciate yeah. it very much thank you uh, if you could hang out for 10 more seconds i just want to say thank you so much to every single person that watched this or listened to this on whatever platform Form, you did listen to it definitely 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 go check out james's stuff and everything that he is up to go follow him on all social media platforms as well as subscribing or following or whatever platform you were listening to the best way to support this channel is checking out my own original music and i'll see you in the next video have a great day god bless and peace out